Okay, everybody. Uh, this is uh, the last evening. I'm just going to turn on my video here. This is the last evening for our educational virtual animal science sessions for this uh, year. We've been really pleased and grateful that you've all been able to attend uh, the sessions we've had this year. We've had beef uh, carcass evaluation. We had, and we have this session tonight that's going to end our and our uh, group for this year. Uh, so just a couple of things here related to um, kind of housekeeping. I'm just gonna show a PowerPoint presentation for you all. Uh, we are going to entertain questions this evening by looking at the bottom of your screen, there will be a Q&A box. Uh, so if you've got any questions for myself, Dr. Nate, or uh, Todd Taylor, who's also on this evening, please feel free to put it in the question, the Q&A box. Um, that's the best uh, way for me to kind of keep them organized. Todd and I are gonna be managing the questions um, on the on the backside while, while Dr. Nate is uh, giving a presentation for you guys tonight. A um, couple of things, uh, looking forward to a great evening, but um, it all starts with great listening and learning um, and leaving the chat alone and keeping your questions in the, the Q&A portion uh, for this evening. Uh, it's a different type of system, a Zoom webinar, than maybe you're, you're used to, like through school. Um, you're not going to be able to see others tonight. Um, and, and so... Uh, you, any questions or interactions that you want to do with the speakers or myself, please go ahead and do that through the question and answer section, okay? Um, the next slide is many of you I know are interested in receiving educational credit for this evening uh, in order to show, exhibit, sell at your county or local uh, community fairs. So if you're interested or needing that type of um educational credit, there's a form here. Um, it was in the email you received. Uh, so if you wanna uh, make some notes tonight and put that on this form, uh, you can go to the, the form link that is in the Q&A for everyone to see. You can click on that. And at the bottom of the page is a, is a verification uh, form link that you can print this form out and send it uh, to your local uh, county fair uh, organizational and leadership group, okay? Uh, if you are interested in keeping up with what's going on with you, youth livestock in Wisconsin, uh, these are a number of links and social media and lots of ways to keep uh, active with what's going on educationally through the Wisconsin Youth Livestock uh, Program. There's two links to, to two different websites uh, to keep you abreast of what's going on. The YouTube channel is very important. All of the many years that we have done this virtual programming is available. All the videos are available at the YouTube channel. And this evening's uh, recording will be available there as well. Uh, after a few days after uh, tonight's session, you will find it there. And if you've registered, obviously you did. If you're here tonight, um, you will get an email that illustrates when that recording is ready uh, to be to be viewed because I know many could not make it tonight um, and, and we'll be viewing it, viewing it later. Uh, Facebook, Instagram are the two popular social media sites that we keep uh, events and scholarships and any type of um, state fair, any type of event that you might be interested in uh, will be posted there. So please uh, make sure you like or follow those two um, social media uh, outlets, uh, Twitter, we have a Twitter um, handle, but we don't really use it that much. So um, Instagram's kind of our game these days. And then tonight, uh, after uh, the program is over, please fill out the survey. When you close um, the Zoom tonight, uh, it should kick you over to the survey that we have for you to fill out. And we'd love to hear from you. What other topics would you like to hear about? What other things interest you? And we'll definitely try and get them into the cycle for uh, next winter spring uh, uh, programs that we offer, okay? So I think at this point, I'm gonna stop my share. Um, again, we almost got 100 people on here tonight. So that's great to see and, and, and um, be able to share out what uh, Dr. Nate's gonna talk about tonight related to uh, reproduction technology. So I'm gonna share his PowerPoint presentation and then quickly give a little introduction of Dr. Nate. Uh, so Dr. Nate is um, 
a veterinarian up in the middle part of the state. He'll give quite a bit of his background, but I wanted to share out that um, he's been doing a lot of work and kind of this is his gig, right? This reproduction area of, of animals. And um, he started his work in the dairy world and he's moved um, into lots of other species since then. And so we wanted to bring him on to talk about all the neat ways that we have grown in the reproduction area in terms of technology that is available to us to be able to uh, really genetically select, right, the superior and high quality livestock that we are looking for across all species from dairy to beef to sheep um, to, to swine and, and even goats has become a part of uh, Dr. Nate's practice. So we're pleased that he's here. Uh, Todd Taylor, who is the sheep unit manager at UW-Madison, who, who utilizes Dr. Nate quite often, uh, is here to support the, the presentation tonight uh, as, as we have done a lot of that type of work, this type of work uh, at the UW sheep unit uh, station. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Dr. Nate. Again, uh, Nate, thanks for being with us tonight. Yes, uh, thank you, Bernie. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. All yep. right, super. Um, yes, well, thank you. I'm uh, very pleased to be here and talk with all of you a little bit about uh, small ruminant, uh, in particular sheep advanced reproduction. Um, so I'm going to just uh, tell you a little bit about myself and my background first, if we go to the next slide. Um, but I received my Doctor of Veterinary Medicine from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2006. Uh, so I've been practicing for about 15 years, and like Bernie mentioned, uh, initially, um, I mean, actually, initially, I was a general practitioner. I did all farm animals, general surgery and medicine, but ultimately uh, kind of kind of focused my work on advanced reproduction in dairy and beef cattle. And over the years, as that all grew, um, there's been a lot of things that have happened. So um in we we not only house donors uh dairy and beef cattle up to about 160 cattle here at a farm um just down the road uh from our office um but we've also developed our own internal uh ivf laboratory and we're going to talk a little bit about ivf down the road um but a big part of my passion has been uh, developing emerging embryo export markets all around the world. So exporting embryos all around the world. I sit on uh, a number of committees that work with the US government to help uh, develop these markets. Um, and it's really been quite interesting because I'll just say that although dairy and beef have had a lot of interest in, in exports, I'm starting to get a lot of inquiries from countries we work with about small ruminant embryos as well. So I, I'm pretty excited about the future. And I think in the next 10 years or so, um, we might be exporting a lot of sheep and goat embryos all around the world as well. So, uh, but we specialize in conventional flushing as well as ovum pickup. And I'll talk to you about these technologies a little bit later but ovum pickup for in vitro fertilization. Um, and like I said, we have our own in-house IVF lab. So um, going to the next slide here. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about LAP AI. So laparoscopic artificial insemination in sheep and goats. And then at the end of this, I think Bernie's going to play um, a video of us actually doing this live uh, last weekend. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about surgical embryo collection, uh, as well as uh, how we would transfer embryos and cryopreserve them or freeze them for later use. Um, I'll show you some pictures of, of some embryos, and we'll talk a little bit about stages and grades. And then uh, I think the really exciting part about this presentation and this does get a little, little bit high level here, but laparoscopic ovum pickup and in vitro embryo production. And this really is going to be the future uh, for sheep and goat uh, producers uh, throughout the country. And then finally, uh, why we do what we do. 
so that's the uh, what I'd like to talk about here with you guys today. And we can go ahead to the next slide. So laparoscopic AI. Um, why we need to do laparoscopic artificial insemination in small ruminants is because, of course, of their size. They're too small for us to uh, manipulate uh, per rectum uh, to pass the cervix. Um, additionally, uh, sheep and goats have notoriously very, uh, very difficult cervixes to pass. They're, they're very difficult to pass an AI insemination rod and, and inseminate them uh, transcervically. So passing the cervix, right? So this method was developed, this laparoscopic AI method was developed and is highly effective. And you can see me here doing this procedure. We will uh, sedate the U and put them in a cradle. And many of you may be familiar with this process already. So we put them in a cradle and tip them up so that all of their internal organs and their, their intestines and their rumen will, will fall down away from uh, their reproductive tract. We will then insufflate their abdomen with some carbon dioxide, basically just to give us a little room to see what we're doing. And, and then we'll go ahead and, and put these trocars in, which you can see in this picture here. Put a couple of trocars, which are basically just a, a gateway or a window into the abdomen. And um, through one of the trocars, you'll see I have a laparoscope, which will allow me to visualize what, what is inside the abdomen. And then through the other uh, trocar, we will place the insemination rod. Um, and I think you'll see this in the video later, but the insemination rod has a needle at the, at the very end of it and a semen straw. So a straw of frozen or, or fresh semen um, loaded into that gun. And I will uh, go ahead and basically stab uh, that needle into each uh, side of the uterine horn and inject the, uh, the, the semen into each uterine horn. So you can see on the right here, this is a picture of what I'm looking at. This is the uterine horns um, of, of a ewe that's showing very, a very great estrus here. She's, she's in good heat, very good heat, got lots of tone and edema. This is exactly what I want to see when I get in um, to visualize the uterus. So that they're toned up, they're red, they're edematous, it's standing right up looking at me. And that's, that's this is a, we, we code these uh, from one to three, this is a, a, a three as far as um, a quality of, of the, the heat that she's showing. So, um, so this is just a little bit about the LAP AI procedure. And I did wanna spend a little more time on this because um, you know, this is the, the gateway to all of our advanced reproduction that we are going to be doing in small ruminants. Um, so to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the, the highlights of this procedure, and I did mention it's easier to pass um, uh, the convoluted cervical rings in small ruminants. So um, there's that, but then also we can directly deposit or the semen into the uterus. If it's a poor quality semen sample, we're gonna achieve higher pregnancy rates from that semen. Uh, it's, also, it's also just a very efficient use of processed semen. If we need to, we can even split those straws of semen between multiple ewes um, and just really optimize the use of uh, every single ejaculate from a ram. Um, Ultimately, we can achieve higher pregnancy rates um, and more efficient use of, um, of that ram's ejaculate. We'll go on to the next slide now. Um, and I do just wanna mention that it really is a team effort. Um, when we're doing these in the field and I have my whole team there working, we're cranking these out every probably 90 seconds to, to two minutes. Um, just a very efficient process. We all have our roles and uh, we have a team that's sedating, uh, getting them up on the, the cradles, clipping and scrubbing and prepping them, 
um, blocking the surgical sites. Uh, I have somebody thawing semen for me and handing it to me. And literally, I'm just sitting on my stool uh, and just, uh, you know, inserting the trocars and, and inseminating the ewes. And we can do hundreds of these in a day uh, pretty efficiently. So I just, I really do want to acknowledge that uh, it really is a team effort um, and uh, very appreciative of the great team that I have here at Genovations. So we'll go ahead to the next slide now. And um, so now I want to just kind of shift gears a little bit and talk about embryo transfer. So um, the advantages of embryo transfer are that we can basically have more offspring per donor per year. Also, it helps us to really drive genetic progress. And the two primary ways that that's happening is through selection intensity and generation intervals. Now, selection intensity, you can just think of this very simply as if you have a herd of 100, or a flock, excuse me, of 100 ewes, if you pick the top ewe in your flock to propagate her genetics, that is selection intensity. Instead of um, you know, breeding all of them, maybe you just take the very top U and propagate her genetic line. So that's a very high level of selection intensity. Generation interval is uh, the time frame from uh, the birth of an offspring until she herself becomes a donor. And if we can decrease that time frame, we are going to amplify the rate of genetic progress. Um, so I did just want to mention those couple of key uh, genetic, uh, you know, progress parameters that are really important. And actually, sheep, uh, sheep and goats uh, alike uh, kind of have an advantage as far as they have a shorter gestation interval to begin with. So this is something that uh, can really, uh, really uh, intensify the rate of genetic progress within these breeds and species. Um, so I'm not gonna to talk too much about merchandising or export or biosecurity. I did mention, I think it's going to be um, some huge potential down the road uh, as far as a revenue source, uh, but that's something that'll be coming here in the next 10 years. I do want to mention adaptability though. So embryos acquire passive immunity from their recipient donors. So if we were to take an embryo from a farm in Wisconsin and transfer it into a recipient in California, they might have different diseases or pathogens on their farm, different bacteria or viruses that are threats. Um, and if we were just to take a sheep and haul it across the country and unload it at a farm in California, it might struggle. It might struggle to survive when it gets hit with some uh, uh, bacteria or virus it has not seen before. But with an embryo, because it's born from the ewe that's within that flock, she, she will be conferred um, some passive immunity from that recipient that will protect her. So this, this is a really important concept that gives embryo transfer just a huge edge as far as biosecurity um, and adaptability. And it, and it holds true not only from flock to flock, from state to state, but also country to country if we're exporting embryos. Um, so this is a really important concept as far as providing immunity you know, to, to native pathogens that might exist on any given flock or in any given country. Okay, moving on. Can, to, can, can you just quickly say, uh, Nate, Dr. Nate, sorry to interrupt, but can you yes. just talk a little bit about embryo transfer and, you know, like in the cattle world, dairy and beef, we've been doing this for a long time as, you know, per your picture there. Um, can you just talk a little bit about like differences in species and in, in some, in, especially as it relates to this embryo transfer and other AI technologies? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, thank you, Bernie. Uh, that's a great point. And um, so, yeah, and I, so you can see here in these pictures, um, the picture in the upper right is um, how we used to do this procedure in the 70s. 
um, we would put donor cows under general anesthesia, okay? So they were intubated and they were under gas anesthesia for this procedure. We, it was a surgical procedure. You can see the surgeons have, they're draped in, they are surgically um, collecting these embryos, you know, they're, they're uh, exteriorizing the uterus. And you can see in the picture on the upper left, we have the tip of the uterine horn and the ovary. Uh, this is actually an ovary that has been super stimulated and each of those little red nodules is a CL a corpus luteum, each representing one ovulation and one potential embryo that could be recovered. Uh, and, and so here they are surgically flushing. You can maybe just vaguely see uh, a tomcat catheter coming out of the uterine, the tip of the uterine horn and into this little Petri dish they're holding and they're flushing the uterine horn. So this is where the embryos are seven days old they're in the uterine horn and they're flushing those out. Uh, so this is a in vivo collection, in vivo, V-I-V-O, meaning in, within the body, okay? So the donor is incubating those embryos. She was inseminated and she incubated those embryos for seven days and now we're flushing them out. Now this is how the process used to be done uh, up until, you know, I would say the, uh, the late 70s when actually at our own University of Wisconsin-Madison, Dr. Bob Rowe um, helped to innovate and discover a non-surgical method to flush donors. Um, interestingly, using a, a human urinary catheter, we can do this non-surgically. Of course, it's far less expensive, far less invasive, much, much safer for the donor and much faster. So that all of that brought the price point way down and made this technology far more accessible uh, for all of our producers. Um, so, so this is, it's, it's good historical content to understand this is where we came from. And it was only, you know, 30, 40 years ago and, and look where we've come. So uh, we've really advanced uh, quite a long ways. Now, having said all that, in small ruminants, and I'm sorry, maybe I'm diverging here a little bit, but Having said all that, with small ruminants, we cannot, again, you know, manipulate the cervix and the uterine horns per rectum, obviously. They're, they're very small, right? So, so, so we are still surgically collecting uh, sheep and goats uh, by the same method. Um, but I'm going to talk a little later about what the future of, of that industry will be. So is, it, is that what you were kind of hoping for, Bernie? Yes, that was great. Yep. Very good. Very yep. good. So I advanced so your we'll, slide for you. Awesome. So we'll Nate, move on. One, to Nate, one question did come in. You can answer this later if you want, but there was a question about what you charge to inseminate ewes, and I'm, I'm assuming on a, probably on a per head basis. So I don't know if you want to touch on that later. Or just, I just Yeah. Yeah, I can, and I can send out our price list and some information about us. Um, it really kind of depends on the volume if we're doing one or we're doing a hundred, you know. Um, but uh, but yeah, we can talk about that later for sure. So, um, so so like I said, now we are still with small ruminants because they are so small. We have to do this surgically. So these are some great pictures here of us. Uh, here, my team at Genovations, and this is this is us doing these surgical collections. Um, you can see, I'll just say down the bottom left, there's a, a diagram of this human urinary catheter and how it works with um, with cattle. You know, we'll pass that through the cervix, and it's got a balloon that we can inflate. And that balloon that we inflate has two things. It holds the Fully catheter in place, you know, it holds it in one spot, but it also will isolate one uterine horn to be flushed. So um, you can see beyond the balloon, there's the tip of the catheter that has ports in it. And we will then uh, flush media in through those ports and isolate that right horn, flush media in massage it around and then flush it back out. 
Uh, and once it comes back out, we send it down. Um, the, there's a Y connector junction where there's an inflow and an outflow. So we, we go inflow, we flush, we massage, and then it comes back out and we send it down the outflow and it goes, travels to, and I don't have a good picture of this, but travels to um, a filter. And that filter will uh, filter out any of the embryos and we can search for those under the microscope. So this is the Foley catheter method of flushing donors. We, in essence, use this same method uh, with sheep and goats, but we still have to exteriorize the uterus. So um, I think I have a better picture of this later, um, but the middle picture, you can see, I'm actually suturing up both sites where we placed um, the Foley catheter in the flushy torn. So I'm just kind of suturing up the uterus here in the middle picture. And then on the picture on the right, we have another um, a really nice ovary that's been super ovulated. And you can see lots of corpus luteums or CLs there. Um, and I, I believe this donor, she I believe she gave us, it was around 17, I think it was 17 nice embryos from this donor. That's just one ovary that we have exteriorized. So, um, but uh, so those are just some pictures. I'm not going to get into the details of how we do this, other than to just say that um, you definitely need to be fairly skilled surgically. Um, and then also you really need to know what you're doing when it comes to embryo evaluation, how to handle embryos and how to freeze them. Um, so this is, uh, this is something that takes a little time to develop and get, get proficient at. So... If we go on to the surgical embryo collection slide, you can see here, I think, yeah. Okay, so, um, well, it's actually a goat up on the left that we were doing. Um, in the middle picture, you can see both the both uterine horns and uh, the ovary, one of the ovaries that has CLs on it. Um, so that's a nice picture there. And then on the right, this is the actual process of how we do this. You can see um, we are literally injecting uh, a syringe full of flush media through the distal tip, the very, the very end of the uterine horn. And then we have the Foley catheter is coming out here towards the base. So you can almost, you can almost even appreciate a little bit of a bulge there where the Foley catheter is uh, inflated at the base of the uterine horn, kind of holding it in place and just flushing that one side. Um, so we're injecting the syringe, it's going through the entire uterus and then flowing out the Foley and being collected in that, um, that conical, uh, clear conical vial that uh, uh, my assistant with the purple glove is holding. Um, so that, that's the process in a nutshell, literally flushing I mean, it is what it sounds like. We're flushing the uterus out uh, and we hope we're gonna collect those, those embryos at the end. So embryo classification, um, and we're not gonna talk too much about this. Um, if anybody is interested in learning more about embryology, come talk to me later, S send me an email. Uh, you can come do a ride along with us. And uh, this is what we're passionate about. This is what we're really good at is embryology. Um, this is really the, uh, the fun part of our, our business. So um, I'm just going to say that the International Embryo Technology Society has set standards for us to try to you know, become standardized as an industry as far as how we stage their development and, and also how we grade uh, their quality. Um, but that's all we really need to say about embryo classification for this uh, presentation. And uh, then the, the next slide is more of the same. Um, again, we're just talking about the quality. Um, and this might maybe more of a bovine slide. I would say actually with, with small ruminants, grade one embryos, I mean, we can hit 70, 80% all day long. Uh, so these numbers are probably a little, little bit low. Um, small ruminants do tend to be uh, fairly uh, fertile when it comes to uh, pregnancy rates. Um, so, uh, 
So yeah, that's all we need to say there. And then on, on the transfer of fresh embryos, um, there are a number of methods to transfer embryos into a recipient. Um, you can kind of do a method like I showed you with the laparoscopic AI, where again, you're kind of stabbing with a needle into the uterine horn and injecting it kind of like a straw of semen. Um, for us personally, uh, and, and then there's a completely surgical method, but for us personally, we really like the hybrid method. Um, and it's kind of hard to explain, but it, it's um, a little bit of both. We do exteriorize the uterine horn and we'll use a Tomcat catheter to inject the embryo into the uterus, but um, it, we feel it gives us the best pregnancy rates and we're really happy with that method. Um, the only other real important thing I would say is, um, and again, I know you guys are all at different levels as far as your understanding on this, so, but you should know, this is something you should know, uh, that the corpus luteum, or the CL is what secretes the hormone progesterone, okay? Progesterone, progestate, progesterone. It's for pregnancy, okay? And so that CL is what maintains pregnancy. So when I'm looking for that structure on the ovary, I need to place the embryo on the same side as the corpus luteum. We have two uterine horns. We have a left and a right uterine horn and I need to find the corpus luteum, identify that structure. The embryo needs to be transferred on the same side as the corpus luteum. So that's an important point uh, hormonally, physiologically. Um, it's same with humans, all mammals. Um, so a really fundamental point right there. Um, that, that's a big part of what we do when we're transferring embryos. Identify the CL, transfer the embryo onto that same side. Sounds simple enough, right? Okay, so cryopreservation, or we commonly call it freezing. Um, we can freeze embryos for later transfer. Uh, we do this with a controlled rate freezer. It's a machine, uh, does a really nice job. And we use liquid nitrogen to modulate the temperature, uh, to slowly drop that temperature in a way to cryopreserve the embryo. Very complex. Um, you know, biological process and uh, would love to discuss it with somebody if you're ever interested. It's fascinating. Uh, but the, the take home message here is um, we can freeze embryos indefinitely and they will remain viable. They will take a small hit in viability at the time of freezing, like on the way down. Uh, and they will take a small hit when you thaw them on the way up. But that length of time in between uh, could be, literally could be 30 seconds, uh, two days or two million years and nothing will happen to the viability for that embryo. Um, as long as it stays um, at those liquid nitrogen temperatures, which is what, negative 380 degrees C or something like that. So. Um, so that's, that's a really key point, too. And in fact, the U.S. government um, has a bank of uh, they, they are trying to uh, collect all of the, you know, mammals and, and all the embryos that they can, you know, from all the different cattle species, sheep and goats and zoo animals. And they actually keep a bank of frozen embryos just in case we should ever need to try to repopulate kind of like a Noah's Ark, right? Um, so it's really, it's really interesting. And they, they, they keep this bank and they have that in place just in case we ever need to repop repopulate any of our um, uh, not only uh, agricultural species, but other species as well. So uh, it's also very convenient and inexpensive. You can store these long term very cheaply. Uh, they're a very small package. Um, so it, it's a very convenient way to, uh, to store uh, genetics. If we look at pregnancy rates, um, there's many, many factors that go into this recipient quality, um, you know, the skill of the veterinarian doing the procedure. Like we mentioned, the quality of the embryo itself is huge. Um, 
and then the source of the embryo, in vivo or in vitro, um, a little bit lower pregnancy rates with in vitro. And um, if, we are if we have frozen embryos, we're probably gonna have about a 10 point drop in pregnancy rate versus fresh embryos. So I just wanna introduce you a little bit to, to IVF now. Um, so IVF or in vitro fertilization, in vitro means outside of the body. So outside of the body is where these are being grown, where they're being fertilized and where they're being cultured. So what we do with IVF is we will harvest unfertilized eggs or oocytes. We're recovering these directly from the ovaries of a donor uh, by a needle that's connected to a vacuum system. Those oocytes are matured for about one day and then we fertilize them with semen. That's considered day zero. And then we culture those for six more days uh, before we either transfer or freeze those embryos. And again, the important part here is that the fertilization and the culture is all happening outside of the body. So again, in vitro, okay? So this is a picture on the left of uh, some beautiful oocytes that we recovered. So unfertilized eggs or oocytes, they look very different than embryos. They have all this big, poofy, cloudy uh, cumulus cells that we, we call them cumulus cells surrounding the oocytes. Those cumulus cells um, are an indicator of, of the health of the oocyte. The more, the better. Uh, so this is a beautiful group of, of oocytes here. They go into the IVF lab. Gretchen and my team, they do their thing. Um, they fertilize them, they culture them. And then the picture on the right is um, a really beautiful group of uh, IVF produced embryos from our lab. And, and some of them are, they're even hatching. And, and those hatching embryos are the ones that are kind of, they're, they're cracked out of their shell and they're kind of elongating. So you can see that there, there's a few of those. So if we go to the process of IVF, um, and you may recognize this guy here up at the top, um, that's, uh, that's our friend Todd. And I found this picture on, on the internet. So uh, I thought I might as well just use it. But here's, here's a group of uh, apparently sh some show winners that Todd had. Uh, so these will be donors here today uh, representing this, this schematic. Uh, but you can see old picture. <laughs> it is, isn't it? I love it. That's great. Uh, shoot. But yeah, you can see here. Um, so in, in, this is just a schematic of the process. We would retrieve the oocytes. And on the left, you can see a picture of the stimulated ovary. You can kind of make out these blister like structures on the ovary. So each of those is a follicle. And you can see my trocar coming in, and it's not a great picture, but you could, I'm stabbing a needle, a fine needle into each of those follicles, and we're sucking out the contents, the follicular fluid. We're removing those contents, and we hope that the oocyte will come out with uh, that fluid. And we don't, it's not a one for one, but hopefully 50 to 70% of the time we'll recover um, an oocyte. So then we're, we fertilize those in vitro and then uh, they're cultured for five to seven days. And there's another beautiful picture of some embryos and uh, transfer them into recipients. And we hopefully we get a bunch of nice lambs on the ground. Sorry, can you guys still, hear, am I still on here? Yep. Bernie, can you hear? Yep. Yep. Can still okay. hear you. yep. Great. Very good. All right. So we are almost done here. A couple of last slides. Um, we are partnering with a few different groups to do some research on improving the um, efficacy of uh, sheep IVF. It's not perfect. We have a long ways to go. We're working on this, and I, I'm going to hit on this a little bit later. But I did just want to make mention and show a few pictures of some of the uh, some of our friends and colleagues that we are working with uh, to develop these procedures, uh, including uh, some of you may know, but RSG. This is Logan, Dr. Logan, down at RSG uh, in Indiana. 
All right, so once we collect the oocytes, we're gonna search, wash, and grade them. Um, that's on the next, there we go. Um, so again, this is a beautiful picture, a huge collection of oocytes from a, actually a bovine donor, um, I will admit, uh, but a really pretty picture of some oocytes there. You can see some of those oocytes are a little bit what we would call stripped. They don't have as much cumulus cells on them. Um, they can still make an embryo, just maybe not quite to the degree that the ones that have lots of cumulus cells with. Um, but so, uh, and, and the really cool thing about oocytes, I don't know if you guys can see it, but in that upper right picture in, in well five, um, oocytes have enough cumulus cells that you can actually see them with the naked eye, especially on like a black heating stage like we have here. So you might be able to, to appreciate in well five, this is the exact same photo you're looking at um, on the left in the right. So you can actually see them. And it's a lot harder to see embryos uh, than it is oocytes. Okay, if we go to oocyte grading, and I'm, I'm not gonna get into this either too much, um, uh, but I think you guys will be able to appreciate the picture on the left and the picture on the right, okay, they look very different. Um, and this is what we do as embryologists, um, maybe to a little bit higher level, but I think you guys can all appreciate here that on the left, these are what we would consider degenerate or atretic oocytes. They're, they're dying. Like these are not viable. And on the right, these are very healthy oocytes. So visually, this is what we're doing as embryologists. Um, and uh, we're applying that kind of science. Um, details and preparation. So, you know, AI conception rates are a predictor of the success of an ET program on any given farm or in any given flock. I mean, they go hand in hand. I mean, it's going to indicate your health, the nutrition status, vaccination status. All these things are going to go into helping us achieve a very high level of, of success, um, not only in AI, but embryo transfer. Um, work with your local veterinarian, vaccinations, deworming at least 30 days prior. Um, if you want to have a successful ET program, you know, have an increasing plan of nutrition at least 45 days prior to the flush. Um, that's where that word actually came from, the flush, you know, so get them on an increasing plan of nutrition. Um, free choice minerals is huge, great body condition scoring. Um, we want them increasing in body condition score, not going down. It's not just a snapshot in time. Uh, it's more important which direction they're going. Um, so those are some important details uh, to keep in mind. Uh, and then as far as when to transport recipients or LAP AI uh, um, recipients or, or donors even for that matter, um, we really just wanna decrease stress, okay? Uh, I prefer they were only, uh, you know, transported the day of LAP AI or the day of flush or, or transfer and then leave them in their cohort groups for, um, you know, at least 45 days. That's, that's the bottom line. Like leave them within their cohort groups for at least 45 days after the procedure if you really wanna optimize your, your results. Um, it's, ju it's just as simple as that. Stress, the stress hormone, cortisol, it will decrease fertility and it, it's very real. Um, I, I can document it many, many times over. Um, all right, so finally here, advantages of IVF. Um, it is the um, quickest commercially available technology for genetic progress. We can do these collections every couple of weeks, even every five days if we want. Uh, we can do pregnant donors because we are bypassing the uterus completely. We're just going to the ovary. So we can do pregnant donors. You can do ULAMs or prepubertal donors, uh, a donor that has fertility problems. Uh, there are so many advantages that IVF has. Uh, a terminal genetic rescue. You have a valuable you that um, maybe she, she broke her leg or something terrible happened to her 
and she is not going to survive. Well, we have one last chance at harvesting her ovaries and doing a terminal session. So, um, you know, there are so many advantages to IVF. We can use expensive or rare semen, split it among multiple donors. Um, you know, we can put it in you know, in an IVF lab, we can take that one unit of semen and put it in many different wells and fertilize a lot of different donors. You can't really do that with LAP AI. So bottom line is you can get more progeny per donor per year with a wider variety of matings. Um, and you basically increase the productive donor lifespan. Um, and th this is really the key point that I wanna hammer home. Um, you know, we can do these surgical flushes on donors, but after two or three flushes, they will develop a lot of what we call adhesions, um, basically scar tissue on the inside, which makes it, you know, really, really tough to do the procedure again and again. Um, and it gets to be almost, you know, even considering an animal welfare consideration at some point. So this is really the advantage of IVF is it's very, it's, it's not invasive at all. And we can do these donors very often without creating scar tissue. So again, it increases the donor's lifespan from a productive embryo standpoint, and uh, ultimately will allow us to produce more offsprings per donor per year. Now the disadvantage is, however, it is expensive, the equipment is, is expensive, it is technically challenging, and IVF embryos do have a little bit of a lower pregnancy rate than conventionally produced embryos. But the biggest disadvantage right now with sheep is that it's still in basically research and development. Although we can achieve very high uh, embryo production with cattle, beef and dairy cattle, and even very good production with goats, um, sheep, for whatever reason, uh, they're being very challenging. They are tough. Um, and, and this is a huge part of uh, R&D for many IVF labs around the country. Everybody is working on trying to improve the culture ability of uh, sheep um, in vitro produced embryos. Um, and I think we're gonna get there within a year within a year or maybe two years tops, uh, it's going to be a technology that is going to really revolutionize uh, the small ruminant industry. So finally, uh, just why we do what we do. Um, this is about sustainability and feeding the world. And these are uh, statistics from the cattle uh, side of things, but they're very noteworthy. And, and the same holds true uh, for sheep as well. Um, but the world population is growing. Uh, by 2050, they're talking 9.7 billion. Um, it's, it's, it's insane. Um, but because of genetic selection and advancement and, and what we do uh, to propel that industry forward, um, you can look at these numbers. They speak for themselves. It's, it's really incredible. Um, but in the last 70 years, we have 21% fewer cows. Uh, they're being fed 23% less. We're using 35% less water, 10% less land, 24% less manure, and, and the carbon emissions is 37% reduction. Um, it's just, this is, this is largely... Um, this is largely because of the genetic progress that we've made within these breeds and the same will hold true for sheep and goats. So with that, I thank you for your time and uh, be happy to entertain any questions. Yeah, um, so great job. Thanks, Dr. Nate. I'm just gonna bring up the video. Um, and yep. as I do that, can you just share out some like, um, obviously you're a veterinarian and you went through a number of years of school to kind of do this work. You know, my, what might be some career options for people who are interested in reproduction and in this work, but may not want to become a veterinarian, but still wants to engage in this area of animal sciences and dairy science? Yeah, great question. So, I mean, we employ and businesses like myself are looking to hire individuals who want to help us manage our donor herds, 
um, be embryologists, work in our IVF lab, work shoot side with me, um, collecting donors, um, you know, going on big lap AI days and working on surgical prep um, and thawing semen. Um, so all, all of those, all of those areas, um, you know, if you're not interested in, in becoming a veterinarian, there are plenty of other opportunities to, to still become very involved in this industry. Excellent. Great. So here I am, I'm, I'm going to play the video and, um, this was the video that we had captured from, uh, the animal science, uh, sheep, well, the sheep, uh, what is it, Todd, the the uh, Wisconsin Sheep uh, Breeders Annual Meeting and their educational program. And uh, Dr. Nape did this, this presentation. And so I'm just gonna play it that um, what, what the, so I'm just gonna have Dr. Nate kind of talk over what they're doing and we'll get a you on a cradle here really quickly to, to show you what um, actually all of this is in real time. So I'll mute myself and, and pass this to Dr. Nate. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and so right now they are, uh, they're clipping, they're clipping the neck on a U, um, and I'm going to sedate her, uh, with, uh, a little cocktail of Torb, ketamine, and xylazine. Uh, this, this, uh, chemical cocktail has worked really well as a sedative for us. Um, so you're going to see me doing that here in a little bit. Um, so right here, I'm holding off the jugular vein and it's gonna become distended. And you, you can't really see it well, but I'm basically injecting this cocktail right now. I And that's going IV, so intravenously. And again, this is something normally my technicians would be doing. Um, so you'll see me, I'm trying to do all of it today. Uh, I didn't have, I did not have technicians here uh, for this, but again, just to kind of piggyback on Bernie's earlier question, um, these are all aspects of things that somebody could help support um, or be involved with uh, if, if they were interested. So you can see she, she knocked out really, really quickly here. We got her up, we lifted her up on the cradle. Um, they're going to secure all of her uh, all four legs, we have some giant twist ties that work really well for this purpose. Um, so we're getting her, you can see how well sedated she is. She is knocked out. Um, so yeah, we're getting, we're getting those twist ties on there. And then they're going to start clipping and prepping. Here we go. So they're clipping her up. Yep. Todd's doing the sheer job. And then here's where um, Holly, right? Dr. Holly is helping prepare the area, right, Dr. Nate? That's right. Yep. Holly is helping here. So Holly is one of the veterinarians for the university. Um, and she's uh, she's been great. She's we, we work with Holly quite a bit. And she's helping us out here, uh, getting them all, all uh cleaned up. We use a, we use uh, some chlorhexidine and we use um, some alcohol uh, to make sure that that surgical site is as clean as it can possibly be. Miss kind of fast and fast forwarding through uh, yep. this part. And this is where you're kind of talking about the light in your scope and some of the pieces. I may have gone a little bit too far, but yeah, trocar. And yeah, so go ahead. Nope, right here. This is so, where you're so right here. Here I'm I'm giving a lidocaine block. So I'm I'm doing a local anesthetic procedure. We're using lidocaine to block locally, right where my trocars are gonna go through. So trocars are again, it's like a window. Like I said, uh, you'll see those. I'm gonna put those through her abdomen, but with this little bit of lidocaine that I put on both sides, now she's not gonna be able to feel that. So they're gonna wheel her over and put her in place here. One thing I know there was a question earlier on is, you know, if this puts a lot of pressure on the, on the diaphragm and causes you to have trouble breathing, 
These ewes were held off of feed and water for 24 hours. So their rumen is empty, their bladder is theoretically empty as well. Um, and typically when Nate is doing this and he's got his whole team there, she's only going to be inclined for probably, you know, 45 seconds to two minutes at the most if he's struggling to get the semen in her. So this is a little longer. This one was took a little bit longer than typical because Nate didn't have anybody there getting the semen straws loaded for him. Um, but when he does, these ewes are not upside down for very long at all. And, and again, as I said, it's real critical that you hold them off of feed and water for that 24 hours minimum as well, just to, to help take that pressure off of the diaphragm and off of the lungs. But in order to get to the, the uterine horns, we've got to incline them to get all those intestines to fall away from the reproductive tract. Yeah, that's exactly right, Todd, 100%. Like, if we have my whole team there, we are going to crank through these um, yeah, I would say a minute to two minutes, of, like that's it. They'll only be up for that long. But yeah, we have to have them inverted in this position. So all the viscera or GI, uh, uh, you know, everything kind of fall away from the uterine horn. I, you, you maybe missed it there. I, in, I insufflated her with some CO2 so I can see. I inserted now my, my, my laparoscope and I was looking through there to identify that I was in the right location and I was. Um, and then I'm gonna go ahead and put in the other trocar on the other side where you can see where I blocked a little blood there. So I'm gonna put that other trocar in and that's where um, that location is where we will place the AI gun with the loaded semen straw, okay? So and I'm just kind of manipulating and looking around and make sure everything looks good. Want to make sure we have a clean stick and we're not going to be, um, we don't have intestines or the bladder or any of these other structures in the way. So yeah, here's where I have to go around and thaw the semen for myself. Ordinarily, he would have been inseminated by now and been down off the table. Um, but so here we are, which is good. You can see here. So I grab the straw of semen put it in the, the water bath, and we're thawing it right now. How long does it stay in the water bath, uh, Dr. Nate? Yeah, so 60 to 90 seconds. It can be longer, but, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, really importantly, you know, we got to make sure we wipe all the water off of the semen straw because that water will... Um, will damage the semen if it makes contact. So once I pull that out, you'll see me, I'll wipe that off really good. Uh, there we are. So cleaning off all the water off that, the, the exterior of the semen straw. And uh, actually I have to go get a scissors here to cut the, the semen straw open. So I do that. And then we load it into the AI gun. So you'll see this here in just a minute. And as he's doing that, Holly's monitoring the U and managing her to make sure she's doing okay. Yep. Dr. Holly, that is. <laughs> yep. And so here I'm loading it up and I'm going to actually advance the tip of the gun just to make sure that I, you pull off the protective cover. I want to make sure that I see some, a, a drop of semen coming out the very tip of that needle. And I did. So... I'm going to go ahead now and again, again, like I was saying, when Nate's got his whole crew there, he's got one person that's dedicated to just loading those semen straws for him. And he's typically got one straw loaded and another one, you know, ready to be loaded, especially if they know if we've got the use sorted and they're coming through right where we're using the same ram on a group of five or six use, you know, they can pull up a straw ahead and have it in the water bath thawing while well, he's AI and the you ahead of her. So it just goes that quickly, as long as you have the crew there that can keep it going steady for Nate. And while he's doing this too, the other part, you know, just to kind of keep in mind is, you know, many of you who are buying cattle or project animals, sheep, swine, you know, beef, many of your project animals may be going through, um, 
or, or our progeny of AI work or ET work. So um, there's investment in your projects to be high quality. So um, it's kind of neat to see this reproduction on the backside, which is maybe not something you see. So I'll be quiet so Dr. Nate can describe this. Yeah, no, you're good. And um, I, I wish we had a video so you could see what I'm looking at. And that's something I think we should work with. Maybe we can do that for, for a future year. Um, but uh, but that, that, that was it. There it was. I injected it. We're all good. I let out some of the CO2 from the abdomen. Um, very minimal bleeding. It's very, again, very non-invasive procedure. I do like to put in a staple or two. It's basically a suture, uh, a metal suture that'll fall out within a few weeks. Um, so we like to do that just to be extra cautious, but really you don't need to. It's such a small incision. And the way we enter the abdomen at an angle, it closes itself up kind of. Um, but that that that's it. And uh, like Todd said, I mean, normally uh, this is a, like we probably would have had five of them done in that time if 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 we had our whole team we were kind of cruising along here so uh, we do like to put a little bit of a biological bandage uh, that's uh, some aluminum spray and we like to cover them with one injection of an antibiotic like uh, like oxytet. And then uh, you gave um, I think an antibiotic right um, to this you or you do give that correct. Yeah, ox we like to use oxytetracycline. Yep. 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 Okay. Um, so yeah, I guess I just wanted to reiterate that, um, you know, just in terms of what uh, Dr. Nate has talked about it with expense and all those things that, you know, just keep that in mind when you're looking for your project animals. Some of you maybe have everything already for this year, sheep and pigs, or you're starting to go through that process or have completed them. And again, many of your your animals are coming from these types of reproductive technologies. Um, so, right, increasing advancement of your higher quality animals to be able to then uh, be able to, right, sell them as project animals for students and youth to show. And so you can see they took her off the cradle and they give her a little minute to, to wake up here. Here's that oxy um, uh, antibiotic shot. And then I think it was just a few minutes later, she was up. I don't know if we have a, if the video captures that or not, but um, yeah. Anything else you want to kind of end with here, Dr. Nate or in, in Todd too, any other comments related to uh, this technology and just like how it's advancing the, the world of genetics? Yeah. I mean, I don't know, Todd, do you have any Thoughts no, on I this? just, you know, I just, I think from a, from an advantage standpoint, the biggest thing for me and the reason we're using it here is it's getting harder and harder to find the RAM genetics that we want and be able to afford them from a, a standpoint of buying the buck that we need. And, and by this method, we can bring in different semen on different RAMs and try them on different use. We maintain some biosecurity that way as well. Um, it, and it's actually, it's helping me go back and find some older genetics that I know breeders put up 10, 15 years ago, still have a little bit of that semen left and I can utilize it, uh, to try to go back to stuff that I knew worked years ago. So that's the biggest reason we're using it on the embryo transfer side. We've just started to kind of get into that. And again, that's to kind of more or less pr proliferate our high quality females that we really want to get more Actually, what I really want out of those females is more daughters to go ahead and replace them within the flock so that, you know, we can we can substantially increase our genetic superior use and, and have more daughters out of those used for the next generation or two generations or three generations, however many. So um, so it's it's definitely got its advantages. The 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 IVF stuff really excites me. I'm looking forward to helping and working with Nate a little bit on that in the future and see if you know, if we can make some of those kind of techniques come to fruition in sheep, because I think that'll be, that'll be really good. Since this is a surgical technique in sheep, the number of times that we can flush use is, is probably limited a little bit more than it is in cattle. So if we can get to where we you know, don't have to do the full surgery and, and can aspirate em or aspirate ova off of them, I think we can do more with females than what we can with even the ET stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think on the, the IVF thing, what a lot of our clients are saying, what they're really excited about is um, 
that generation interval that I mentioned, being able to collect these U lambs the same year. I mean, you think about how quickly we can turn this. I mean, it it's it's pretty uh, it, it it's insane, really. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, I, it is just a little after eight. I, um, really appreciate both Todd and Dr. Nate's time tonight. I always learn more and more every time I listen to a reproduction, um, presentation because every year there's more advancements, there's more learned, uh, knowledge and they're putting it into practice. So, um, I think this type of technology fascinates me and it's always one of those things that, um, is ever changing. And, um, it's something to keep up to date as a producer and an exhibitor, uh, because there's always that importance of in increasing and right. Having available high quality animals and, um, for food consumption, products, wool, um, you know, dairy, eggs, all the things that we consume uh, that are high levels and dense protein that, you know, right, reproduction really is the beginning of all of that. So, um, yeah, I just want to thank you guys for being on. Uh, great questions tonight. This is the last one, as I mentioned, for, for this year. I'm just going to... Um, remind you of two things. One, to make sure you fill out the uh, survey and that'll be up on uh, the, uh, uh, once you close Zoom tonight, you'll be able to hurry up and do that. And uh, we'd love to hear from you what other activities and topics you want to hear more about. And then um, of course, look for us um, for the, the recording, I'll send an email out about that. And then look for us really the, in the fall of the year, we'll start making announcements for the next year's topics. And we'd love for you to participate, um, next year as well. Again, don't forget here at this link is that educational verification form. So if you need to get verification from your County, um, fair or local area that you've attended at something that's educational and you learned, you know, five new things and, and you're going to share out three new um, ideas to your friends and family or other folks you'd like to share about this session, um, please write that in that verification form and turn it into your local people. Uh, please don't send it to me, although I love to read what you learned. Um, it's really for your local fair uh, show and sale groups. Um, so again, it's been a pleasure to host these this year and um, all the best to uh, for a great summer and spring showing season. Um, enjoy your time and learn lots and spend some good high quality time with family and friends uh, at the fair. And uh, those are always the great memory times that uh, we all kind of remember when we're older. So remember that I'm sure Todd and Nate uh, both have those experiences. We both were, well, all three of us grew up in this world um, of animals and youth 4-H FFA and organizations such as those. So um, continue the, the good work that these organizations uh, provide you and uh, have a great year. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Yep. Thanks, Dr. Nate. Thanks, Todd. Thanks, guys.